Hello everyone, uh, around a couple weeks ago I asked all of you to submit your questions in celebration for 500 subscribers, and in the meantime while you were submitting 80 or so questions to me, we ended up getting another 75 to 100 subscribers, which is really exciting. It's really cool to see my channel growing uh, probably about 50 to 100 subscribers a week. Anyway, this video is essentially just answering all those questions. If I missed anything or you feel like I should expound on anything, go ahead and leave further questions in the comments below and I'll try to get to them, although no guarantees this time. I, I spent quite a long time longer time than I thought uh, editing this video so uh, appreciate it or, or, or don't appreciate it and, and criticize me if you'd like but other than that enjoy. What are your thoughts on open borders? The idea of open borders makes sense when people have a relatively free choice. The choice between staying in their home country and going abroad is more a marginal economic choice rather than one out of necessity. And so if it is the case that an open border scheme would lead to a brain drain of the developed nation, it probably makes sense rather to uh, work with that country to develop their institutions and capital assets so that the people there have a more reasonable choice in terms of immigrating. So with that respect, I would say that if you take America as an example, it might make sense for us to have a free movement agreement with, say, Canada or, say, uh, EU members or Australia or maybe even like Argentina or Chile or things like that. Uh, in terms of open borders with the entirety of the world, that might cause a lot of problems, not only in the country of America, but also the countries abroad that might experience that brain drain as a result. How does it feel to have your channel grow so quickly? Well, honestly, I'm not sure that I was ever going to get to 500 subscribers. Uh, at this rate, it looks like I might hit 1,000 uh, before the end of the year, which would be awesome. And that feels really great. It's awesome to be able to make informative economic videos and have, you know, probably a dozen or two dozen comments per video to have a pretty good like to dislike ratio to have general interest in expanding people's knowledge in economics and to then execute on that interest in the form of these videos and actually to see them get result is awesome. Like I said, I hope that I hit 500,000 subscribers one day, but as of right now, it's really cool having uh, a small but growing channel. What candidate or candidates did you support for the 2020 US election and why? Well, if we're talking about the primary process, I'm certainly more of a Democrat in the United States. And when it comes to the Democratic primary, my number one choice was relatively solidified. I was a big fan of Elizabeth Warren. I thought that she brought a relatively policy oriented and a more pragmatic approach to policy relative to Bernie. That being said, I actually love Bernie Sanders. He was the first candidate who I ever cast a presidential ballot for in the Democratic primary in 2016, and I thought that he brought a lot of good ideas to the table. Ultimately, he is who I ended up voting for in 2020. It was a strategic vote. Uh, in my state, Warren simply didn't have the support necessary in order to win. Bernie was essentially competing with Joe Biden to be number one uh, or number two, and so I strategically voted for Bernie Sanders. Um, if we're taking political practicality out of the equation, I, s I would say that my ranked choice ballot would probably look something like in 2020 would probably look something like uh, Elizabeth Warren, number one, Bernie Sanders, number two, uh, and number three, maybe Andrew Yang or Tom Steyer. I would say that those four would probably round out my top four. Now, if we're talking about the general election, of course, I supported Joe Biden uh, just because I'm more of a Democrat and I wasn't unhappy with supporting Joe Biden at all. I think that the proof is in the pudding. I think he's done a lot of good work in office already, and I look forward to see what he does for the next three and a half some odd years. What are your thoughts on capitalism and climate change? Do you think capitalism is the cause? I suppose the cause of climate change. Industrialization is probably a more reasonable thing to blame for climate change than capitalism. Of course, we had capitalism uh, in capitalist sort of market structures before industrialization, and we didn't exactly have the same problems. A lot of the reasons that climate change is so pervasive has to do with the fact that we have industrialized and we have these new technologies that output a lot of greenhouse gas emissions, but at the same time, we're also relatively cheap and it doesn't really cost anything to pollute the air currently. Now, in terms of the first question, what are your thoughts on capitalism and climate change? Uh, overall, I would say that capitalism has a place in terms of solving climate change. I think that capitalism does a pretty good job with taking a base technology and then expanding it into something much bigger and better than we could have possibly imagined. And so I hope that that is what capitalism's place is. The reality is, though, is that the problem of climate change is so pervasive and so potentially catastrophic that it's going to take a large generational and coalition effort amongst governments and amongst peoples and businesses in order to steer the course away from climate change catastrophe, capitalism or otherwise. 
How would you address climate change and what methods do you advocate for to prevent climate change? Now, if I was the emperor of the world and could essentially just dictate what we do in terms of climate change, I would enact a relatively generous subsidization of green energy technologies. It would probably cost uh, little to nothing to put solar panels on your house. We would probably have a great expansion of modular nuclear technology. We would invest a ton of money into nuclear fusion technology, and we would also probably have a lot more offshore wind than we have now. Now, something else that we need to invest a ton of money into is battery technology. One of the big problems with electricity on the grid as it is currently is that it's hard to store uh, electricity. And so a lot of the times there's what's called curtailments, which is essentially where uh, solar and wind farms produce a lot more than is actually needed in the grid. And that's just lost to the grid forever because it can't be sent back into the grid because we'd have overload. So battery technology is really important. Something I'm also planning a video about uh, is carbon capture technology and hydrogen storage and hydrogen power in general. So those are two things that I would also pour a lot of money into as well. What is my favorite constitutional design? I read the uh, more in-depth explanation of this question and essentially what the rationality report is asking is what is the form of government that I favor? A maybe parliamentary system, a more presidential system. I would say that my favorite constitutional design is probably the presidential system. I know that presidential systems have proven to be somewhat unstable relative to parliamentary systems, but at the end of the day, I think that a people having a more direct vote in terms of who is the head of their executive it makes a lot of sense whether the individual cabinet level positions are elected or appointed by the president. What was your political journey? Have you had any cringy political phases? My political journey was pretty normal, I think, for a kid where I'm from. I grew up in a relatively conservative family, and so when I first started initially asking those type of political questions, I kind of tended towards conservatism. This was probably when I was 10 or 11 or 12, but I had a unique upbringing in the sense that my grandma, who really raised me, was economically conservative, but she was actually very socially liberal. She was conservative, but in the reality, she did seem very liberal when we talked. Despite being self-proclaimed a conservative Christian woman, she was always incredibly pro-trans rights, incredibly pro-gay rights, uh, and so I never had any of those prejudices growing up. I never had to work uh, through them because they were just part of who I was growing up uh, to be pro-gay and, and pro-trans. And uh, given that, uh, I was economically conservative probably at 11 or 12, but then when I started following the 2000 presidential election, Barack Obama was so inspiring that that certainly moved me farther to the left. Uh, and so in high school, which was from 2011 to 2015, I think I fell a little bit into the sort of anti-SJW Gamergate sort of style discourse. But that didn't really last very long, just because I think I realized that the gamification of discourse surrounding the anti-SJW movement uh, is really why I supported some parts of that movement but at the end of the day that movement didn't really hold up to a lot of scrutiny and so um you know i, I was never particularly vocally anti uh sjw you could say i suppose but uh nowadays i'm i'm i'm, I'm just extremely liberal in, in pretty much every way what are your thoughts on ngdp lt and do you plan on making a video on it and subsequently what are my thoughts on ngdp targeting so for those of you who don't know, I had to look this up myself. In GDP targeting is more or less a system of a monetary structure that targets, rather than inflation or employment levels, targets the nominal gross domestic product growth. So what do I think about it? I'm not really sure what to think about it necessarily. I would say that the reason that the target of inflation and price levels for a monetary system makes sense is because that's oftentimes what determines the credit worthiness of a nation. And so when you have inflation that's out of control, I think that that's what can really hurt your nation's ability to deficit spend, access credit, things like that. Now, as far as in GDP targeting as a method or a proxy for controlling inflation, I'm not sure how bore out that is. I'm sure that you could find some theoretical papers that show that, you know, maybe theoretically this would be better, maybe similar to MMT. Uh, but I'm just not sure that I would risk the transition versus what we have now, which seems to be a relatively strong and institutionalized governing state regarding our monetary policy. Uh, but I'm certainly open to hearing more about it. Ultimately, I don't know a ton about this, uh, so I'm skeptical of it, but I'm certainly open to changing my mind. Do you invest in a stonks? If so, what are your thoughts on investing in the stock market? Well, I certainly have done investing here and there. Um, I, I, I was relatively poor for most of my life uh, until I got a pretty good job after graduate school 
Um, and so I couldn't really invest a ton of money into the stock market because I was paying off student loans. I was paying for my living situation. I had to, you know, pay, I was paying for a vehicle, things like that. And so I didn't really have a lot of disposable money that I could tie up into the stock market in order to get returns because I often needed my paycheck as soon as I got it. But whenever I did have the opportunity to invest and today, I did a little bit of trading on the actual individual stock levels. I tend to try and do impact investing as much as possible. So investing in green energy companies, is investing in companies with sustainability goals, investing in companies that treat their workers relatively well. Um, that's what I try to do. And other than that, I think that your best bet is always to park your money in index funds, you know, the S&P 500 index, the S&P 500 growth index, inflation protected bonds. Uh, th these are the type of things that uh, you should probably invest your money in uh, on a passive level and leave the actual uh, active analysis, the speculative analysis to the professionals on Wall Street, although even they seem to struggle with actually getting <laughs> good risk adjusted returns. So, hey, it's anyone's game, I suppose. What is your most controversial position? Controversial meaning relative to the standards of the groups you generally align with. So relative to the standard of the groups I generally align with, I generally align with the American left or maybe the social democratic, maybe wing of the Democratic Party. I would say that the most controversial position I have relative to those groups uh, is probably the tax structure regarding corporations and businesses. I think that there's a lot of merit to actually having a relatively low corporate tax. Uh, now, the global minimum tax that the Yellen Treasury Department has announced that at least they're advocating for or trying to put together makes a lot of sense. But in terms of taxation, it probably does make sense to have a low corporate tax, low by international standards. And so right now it seems like the OECD median or average is maybe 20 or 25 percent. And so having a corporate tax around there or lower than that seems to make the most sense. Now, where do you make up the revenue? I think a lot of economists have argued that you should make up the revenue of low corporate taxes with uh, equal revenue neutral carbon taxes. That way you can solve for climate change, but you also encourage companies to invest in market oriented solutions to climate change. And everywhere where a carbon tax has been steadfastly implemented, it has been relatively positive. Uh, I think that the example of Canada is unique and also very, very positive in the sense that well, you know, oh, if you implement a carbon tax, prices will increase, but they just take all the revenue from the carbon tax and just reimburse individual consumers. So I would say that's probably where I'm most different from the average Democrat. I would probably advocate for keeping corporate taxes relatively low, but also at the same time, we should, of course, close loopholes and we should, of course, have structures that encourage corporations to enact favorable and advantageous working conditions and collective bargaining amongst their workers. What hobbies do you have? Well, I would say that the hobby that I'm focused on most right now is probably this YouTube channel, uh, you know, researching economic issues, producing scripts and videos on it. That's something that I spend um, a pretty good amount of my free time doing currently. Uh, if I'm not producing videos, I'm certainly one to play video games here and there. I was a I was a very, very skilled Hearthstone player for most of my college uh, experience, as skilled as you can be at Hearthstone. I also played Civ 5 and Civ 6. Outside of video games, I would say that my number one hobby is probably basketball. Do you love black people? Just answer the question. I love black people. How do you formulate your opinions in areas where the data isn't so clear? So I think that in issues where the data isn't so clear, you can rely on simple logic and your experience. You can also rely on spuriously related things. So for instance, say that the data wasn't so clear on whether or not we should have a single payer or a government option of healthcare. Well, we could rely on market fundamentals and construct a categorical framework for evaluating whether or not this industry should be heavily regulated and subsidized and potentially government run. That's kind of where I would come at. It would depend on the issue. Um, that you that you might be addressing, you know, where the data isn't so clear, but um, that's kind of where I would go is relying on at least a relatively robust economic framework and trying to look at perhaps issues that are spuriously related that you could garner some truth in the area where the data isn't so clear from. And the worst case scenario is, hey, you can make the data clear. You can always do your own study and look at the available data yourself and organize it in such a way that can hopefully help you draw some reasonable conclusions from it. What are some of the ways, perhaps methodological flaws or red flags, you can identify bad studies? Bad studies certainly exist, but I think the number one thing to look at is how people cite studies. A lot of the times people will cite studies without understanding the methodology or without really injecting the nuance that is typically present in the conclusion of the authors. And so it's important that whenever someone cites a study, if you've got a funny feeling about it, or if you feel like there could be problems, look through the study yourself. Because a lot of the times, plainly, people will cite studies without actually giving 
reasonable nuance or credit that the author injected themselves. And at worst, they might actually purposefully misrepresent the actual conclusions of the authors. In terms of methodological flaws, you can also sometimes find a sort of disconnect between the actual methodology of the authors and what their conclusion reasonably should be given their methodology. For instance, if you find an author taking an incredibly concrete conclusion based on a snapshot of data, oh, look, it's, these countries are like this and these countries aren't like this. Well, here's one difference that I've sort of subjectively identified. This might be the explanatory variable. Well, that's not really a reasonable methodology. And even though there is some value to a methodology like that, if the author comes to a relatively concrete conclusion, that's what can kind of give you some insight as to where their mindset is or their biases are. Oftentimes when you find studies out in the ethos of Google Scholar or the ethos of publication journals, you'll find that the authors come to relatively nuanced and qualified opinions. It's rare for someone with a relatively robust publication history to come to concrete conclusions. For instance, if they were to say, this is definitely the case no matter what, or this is the concrete conclusion we can draw, that's probably a sign that they're coming at this issue with some sort of bias. Even people who put together meta-analyses, which is more or less just a study of studies, those people often don't come to the most concrete conclusions because they typically leave room for the advancement of literature, or they leave room to reflect on their own biases or potential methodological flaws. Oftentimes authors are humble like that, and so if you find an absent of those type of characteristics in the conclusions of a study, it probably means that there's some sort of flaw in the study or in how the study's data is being interpreted interpreted by the authors. You mentioned living in poverty in college. What is your current profession and how long did it take you to get out of poverty? Currently, I'm working in the finance sort of departments and sector within the energy industry. And in terms of how long did it take to get out of poverty, I would say that I grew up a relatively lower middle class style life. I didn't have a lack of quantity of food in the house, although I probably had a lack of diversity of food in the house. I never exactly lacked for clothes when I needed them. Um, but at the same time, I didn't travel very much much as a kid. I didn't go out very much. Uh, there wasn't much room in the budget for, um, you know, doing fun things that weren't free. That was more or less what my experience was in college as well. And I didn't really start making pretty good money that I could live on and live a relatively comfortable life until I graduated from graduate school for the second time. What do you do as a job outside of YouTube? So I work in finance in the energy sector. I'm not sure how much more specific I can be. Uh, a lot of what I do is financial modeling, uh, benchmarking, so looking at peers and seeing how like our company stacks up to theirs. Things like that. I mean, it, it's it's relatively mundane work, but it's the work uh, that you'd probably see uh, cited for anybody who works as a financial analyst at essentially any company. <laughs> what is your job and how much do you enjoy it? So I've already answered really what my job is. And in terms of how much do I enjoy, it's more or less asking, you know, how much do I enjoy uh, Excel analysis, presentation and data dissemination and things like that. The answer is I really do like that kind of work. That's why I got into YouTube more or less doing the exact same thing, with the only difference being that the research topics I express in my videos are ones that I choose rather than ones that are assigned to me. What are your career plans? My career plans are either to be part of an executive of some corporation or to ideally start my own business. I remember once seeing CGP Gray say that his general goal in life, or he framed it uh, to such a, an extent that his goal was to have a job or a profession that allowed him to control his own time as much as possible. And that really did shape the way that I think on those issues. And so that's more or less my goal as well, to establish myself in a career enough that I can control my time or that I can retire early enough that I can control my time. How do you manage your time between full-time work and making videos? Uh, the answer is that more or less, I just have a passion for making these videos. And the answer is that I don't really spend a lot of my free time not making videos. That might sound sad, but the truth is to me making videos is no different than playing basketball or playing video games or doing anything that any random person might do uh, with their free time. And so I really enjoy making videos. And so to me, it doesn't really seem like I'm sacrificing a lot of time. Rather, I'm just spending my free time doing what I just kind of want to do. I wouldn't have a YouTube channel if I didn't want to. 
I don't really have any illusions of going full time making YouTube videos, but if that were to happen, it would be awesome. Although right now it's a hobby of mine and I do enjoy doing it. Why did you decide to study economics and is it worth it? So I went into college as an electrical engineering major, uh, originally wanting to study renewable energy, but the electrical engineering department head didn't exactly leave a lot to be desired, at least in the department of electrical engineering at my university. Uh, for instance, he uh, somewhat bluntly and perhaps helpfully to some said that you know college is not going to be very fun for you it's going to be horrible you're not going to have a good time uh, and frankly you're not going to enjoy it <laughs> and um, that wasn't that didn't really engender a lot of confidence for me I went into college with a lot of AP and dual credit credits so I, I had about uh, probably about a year and a half worth of college credits uh, at the time that I entered college. Um, and that's great, but what it meant was that I was essentially registering as a sophomore, but with the freshman class. Well, the problem is that registration opened up in April for the people who were already going into their sophomore year. And for me, since I was registering in the summer with along with the other first year college students, I essentially had the worst like bottom of the barrel pick for my classes in July because all the good time slots all the good professors were already taken and essentially what that meant was that all my professors would have been terrible my schedule would have been incredibly choppy so it's like I would have had like you know I was commuting to school so I would have had to get to campus at eight o'clock in the morning and then in class until 10 a.m and then I would have had to wait until 5 30 for a lab and so the electrical engineering path seemed horrible to me I ended up studying uh, political science as an alternative, but then about halfway into my political science education, although I very much enjoyed political science, I didn't really see a great career path ahead of me. And so I decided to go with economics because it was within the same uh, division of my university. And so it wasn't uh, as much rigor morale to add a second major versus switch majors or a major with another division. So I went ahead and went with economics. I was very scared of the math. I was very scared of the theory, but I ended up loving it. I went into economics and really took it to stride, I would say. And then I ended up studying finance uh, as part of a second master's degree. Economics was my first master's degree. Is it worth it? In terms of my economics education, uh, unfortunately, it's hard to say because really what I relied on to get my job was my finance education. The unfortunate truth with someone who has a master's in economics is that you can pretty much do anything that someone with an MBA or someone with a finance master's can do. The problem is that everyone who is hiring for positions in the field of finance often has an MBA or a finance degree. And so they're not necessarily going to know for sure that, oh, an economics guy can do what I do. They might think that they're unique or more unique than otherwise is probably fair. And so, you know, uh, if I had tried to get a job with just my economics degree, I'm not sure how that would work out. I can tell you that a lot of the people in my economics master's program ended up doing a fairly uh, broad set of work. Uh, some actually became programmers, some, some worked. I, I know one guy who ended up working uh, as an insurance adjuster, which is definitely good money. Uh, and I knew one guy who uh, you know ended up doing his PhD. I had a friend who worked for the IMF, actually. I had a friend who worked for the World Bank. Um, I had a friend who ended up working for, I think, the... Uh, the Bank of England, I want to say. I think that if your goal is to just have a decent job after your education, economics can certainly get you there. But you have to understand that it's really important to network. It's really important to make those connections. And it's really important to follow up with your network when you're looking for a job. And your job search should probably start in the December or November before you graduate the following May, just to give you some some relatively generic, but also very helpful advice if you've never heard it. What books or courses about economics or political science do you recommend? So I get this question a lot, you know, wh wh what books do I recommend? Wh what courses should I take? Uh, things like that. And really my answer is that I don't know because I don't read a lot of books. Uh, really what I read is uh, studies in the field. And I also try to listen to a lot of podcasts and a lot of discussions and debates between scholars within the field. Um, honestly, I don't have a lot of time when it comes to actually, you know, sitting down and dedicating eight to 12 hours uh, in, 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 in cumulative time to read an entire economic or political science book. There are some books that are exceptions to that rule, but, you know, they're relatively old or I haven't really thought about them for a while. Uh, and so what I would really recommend people to do, at least if you want to study economics and political science the way that I do, is... Go to Google Scholar, go to the IMF resource page, go to the World Bank resource page, go to economic journals, go to political science journals, and essentially just look for the fields that you're interested in. You know, if you're interested in health economics, if you're in interested in political institutions, if you're interested in democratization, go into those fields, look at who the most uh, well-known authors are, read their works and their studies, and just kind of go from there. Uh, I think some helpful advice that uh, I heard Socialism Done Left once give in terms of researching a subject is if you want to know the 
um, general reasonable position for a field, uh, look up what you're interested in. So if you're interested, say, in the minimum wage, look up minimum wage meta-analysis on Google Scholar uh, or in Google in general and read the meta-analysis, read the, uh, you know, some of the select literature of that meta-analysis and go from there. It can really help you uh, round out your opinions and it can really help you have at least a well-founded empirical basis for the opinions you hold, assuming that you hold sort of standard publications in high regard, which you should if you're not uh, an anti-intellectual, let's say. Who are your favorite economists? And I'll assume that this is talking in the present day. I would say that presently my favorite economists uh, are probably like Paul Krugman, very standard pick. He seems to do a pretty good job of representing the you know, relatively standard sort of left uh, perspective. I think that he he does a good job advocating for the things he advocates for. I would say that Stephanie Kelton is a very interesting economist. I like reading a lot of her stuff and her work on MMT. Although I am not an MMTer, I certainly agree that she advocates for her field very well. Uh, and she typically comes uh, to issues with a, a relatively nuanced uh, understanding. But again, the truth is I don't really follow a ton of economists on an individual level. I'm certainly more into politicians and politics. Uh, I would have a more succinct answer if you asked me who my favorite politicians were, and I'd probably have more reasons as to why. But generally, I just follow the literature. And a lot of the times the literature comes from all sorts of different people in different places. And so it's kind of hard to build out who my favorite economists were. There are probably coincidentally economists that I've read a lot of and really respect, but I just don't pay attention a ton to the name of who I'm reading when I read a study, unfortunately. So I don't have a better answer for this question uh, than I maybe would if I paid more attention to that kind of stuff. Why don't you identify yourself as a neoliberal slash Reddit neoliberal instead of a social democrat? And conversely, do you considered yourself a neoliberal? That misspelling might be mine or it might be Didymus's misspelling. You find out uh, pretty much never because I guess I did private the video. So who knows whose fault it is? I would say that I probably don't consider myself a neoliberal um, just because that's a fairly nebulous term. It can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And that means that the label is probably relevant relatively useless. I would say that Social Democrat at least has a more concise label with a more colloquially understood set of policy prescriptions, but a lot of the times ideology labels can be somewhat useless and it really depends on the person who is being labeled and the person doing the labeling. Sometimes the label is very nebulous, but sometimes it's nebulous artificially because the person using the label just either doesn't really understand it or is misapplying it. Uh, and so I'm not really going to consider myself a neoliberal because that term seems... Uh, you know, nebulous to essentially anyone who uses it. Uh, it seems to be more of a meme term at this point. I had a lot of fun participating, uh, not participating in, but advocating for, uh, within the neoliberal shill bracket uh, on Twitter. If you're familiar, the streamer Bastiat ended up winning uh, in the shill bracket, which was pretty fun. Um, but that was uh, kind of a meme, you know, and so I'm not sure how popular the term is genuinely used, the idea that you would consider yourself a neoliberal in general. Why do you describe yourself as a social democrat and not a democratic socialist? Do you believe that the dictatorial structure is more suited to providing for a society? Well, to answer the first question, I don't consider myself a democratic socialist just because I don't believe that the means of production or all means of production should be owned by the workers. I do believe in democratic structures in the workplace, but I also believe that capital has a seat at the table that is reasonable and righteous and I also feel like uh, capital being compensated for the risk that they took to start the business is pretty reasonable as well. At the same time, I believe in things like inheritance taxes. I think that certain forms of wealth taxation makes sense uh, and I think that you could make a pretty solid argument for profit redistribution to workers, although uh, I'm not necessarily sold on that one myself. Now, on the second question, do I believe that the dictatorial structure is more suited to, to providing for a society? Um, the answer is kind of. It might just depend on the industry. Um, based on a lot of the literature that I've read regarding collective organization in terms of the worker cooperative structure, sometimes these structures uh, struggle in high fixed cost industries. So maybe a uh, you know privately organized, more traditionally run company would make more sense in those industries. Um, although I haven't thought deeply about that. I would say that in general, the private organization of a society seems to be effective at distributing scarce resources, although those markets do require some uh, relatively heavy government oversight depending on the market. What are your biases? Well, I guess uh, the political ideology test should hopefully have shed some light on my biases. I would say that I'm pretty much left of center. I tend to be very skeptical when someone uh, sends me a link from a right-wing source, uh, and I'm probably not as skeptical when someone sends me a link from a a left-wing source, uh, although I try to, whenever I look over news articles or whenever I looked over sort of more brazen analysis, I try to look into the sources and look into the analysis and see if it really makes sense. But 
uh, the truth is it can be difficult to do. Uh, and so the best thing that you can do in order to challenge your biases is really just to confirm them with as many people as possible, to look into the open literature, to look into the opposition discourse, see what they're both saying, see if you can reconcile them, see if you can come to reasonable and evidentiary conclusions uh, that can uh, bring you to one side or another or bring you to a relatively nuanced take. Thoughts on Reagan and Thatcher? Well, I'm not exactly a huge fan of Reagan or Thatcher. I think that a lot of their deregulation and sort of what you could call neoliberal policies, uh, what I would essentially just call right-wing policies, were definitely not exactly very positive. I think that Reagan specifically led to a lot of racist sentiment being targeted towards welfare recipients, which I think was very negative for the development of welfare in the United States. In terms of Thatcher, I'm not quite as familiar with her economic prescriptions, other than the fact that she uh, generally tried to dismantle and was relatively successful at dismantling the welfare state in the United Kingdom and that the outcomes of that aren't exactly robustly positive. Um, of course, as an American, I'm more familiar with Reagan, and I certainly wouldn't defend most of Reagan's policies uh, on an economic level. Thoughts on Friedman? Well, honestly, I don't really get very bogged down with old economic theory or theorists, and so I'm not super familiar with him specifically. The oldest theorist I'm probably most familiar with is Keynes, but that probably shouldn't surprise anyone given where I come from in the economic school of thought. So unfortunately, I can't really give a super robust answer to this question. Friedman's Friedman, he's relatively influential, uh, but I'm not super familiar with the contents of his writings or the nuances of his writings, other than to say that I know he's super pro-free market and there are problems there, um, but that's about all I could offer to this question. What are your thoughts on future implementations of artificial intelligence within the field of economics? I think a lot of businesses in general are currently developing, if not having already deployed, uh, AI systems that can trade for them, that can procure goods for them, that can uh, hopefully get the best deals and the quickest deals possible. A lot of people are interested in AI as a form of central planning, but the reality is I'm not sure that the technology is quite there or ever could get there. Um, the type of AI that would be required to efficiently centrally plan an economy would be so incredibly robust. I think it's sort of outside the realm of our current lifetime understanding of technology and computing. But that's all I can really offer, just to say that, hey, if we could develop a really robust and awesome AI system that could help us efficiently distribute scarce resources, well, hey, why not? Let's uh, give it a shot. Thoughts on Switzerland's economic model. The Swiss economic model is pretty interesting. I guess I'm most familiar with their healthcare system. Uh, overall, I would say that their focus on banking has sort of uniquely insulated them from a lot of worldly conflicts. Of course, uh, it didn't really make sense for anyone to invade Switzerland throughout time because of this, and also the fact that Switzerland geographically would be very hard to invade. Um, overall, I would say that their economic model isn't quite so far different uh, from the other governing economies of uh, Europe or Nordic countries where they have a relatively robust welfare state. I know that Switzerland specifically has very strict immigration requirements that I'm not sure I know enough to really comment on. In the sense that they have a relatively generous welfare state, they have relatively subsidized education. Uh, I know that they do have some regulations and a mostly privately run health insurance system. Uh, and so that's an interesting model uh, when you when you think about health economics in general. What would be your plan to deal with jobs being outsourced and automated in a social democracy? So I think that eventually if automation became a big enough problem in terms of job losses, what you'd probably need to implement is a relatively high capital gains tax coupled with some sort of a UBI or some sort of a more uh, universal uh, social assistance program similar to Nordic countries where people who lost their jobs were able to more easily fall back onto a government system that could help pay and subsidize for their retraining. And I think more importantly uh, that welfare systems across the world don't really deal with enough is people's ability to move. Uh, I think unfortunately people don't have an ability to leave their state uh, and go uh, you know, uh, elsewhere in the country essentially and get a job if they need to. Thoughts on social wealth funds? Well, this was something I hadn't really given a lot of thought about until I debated with Socialism Done Left. Um, overall, it doesn't sound like the worst idea in the world. It just depends on where the funds come from, how they're organized, and how they're distributed, of course. I think that the case of Norway makes sort of natural sense for a social wealth fund in the sense that this is a social wealth fund that is oriented around a single industry, a state-owned enterprise, their oil company, and that the dividends of that oil company are used in order to fund a government operation sort of like a government established endowment program and I think that that's an interesting idea and I think that there's certainly an interesting application of that idea overall. What are your opinions on social wealth funds versus Australia's superannuation? Well, the way that I understand it, a social wealth fund might be used in perpetuity, so the dividends are sort of collected on a yearly basis and also distributed on a yearly basis more equally and more broadly than in the case of Australia's system, which is essentially just a social security style system that's invested in the market. 
Um, I would say that currently the Australia superannuation system is probably more proven to be successful. I would say that that's maybe what I would prefer between the two, although I'm not super familiar enough on the two to give a, a very definitive opinion on either one or to give a, a straight up recommendation on either one, although the Australian system is probably more uh, provably successful uh, than a social wealth fund more broadly. What do I think of Paul Krugman? I think that he does a pretty good job advocating for leftist economics or left economics, I should say, uh, not necessarily leftist economics, depending on the person. I think he's also made some pretty boneheaded predictions. I think famously he said that the internet would just be a fad. Um, his work on free trade has been uh, criticized in sort of the postmodern, you know, current day economic ethos in the sense that he um, maybe didn't account for the localized losses uh, attributed with trade as well. And that's not necessarily an indictment on free trade in general. It's just the idea that we didn't really think about compensating the losers for free trade as much as we just thought about the net benefits from free trade. How long does it take you to produce these videos? Well, I would say that it depends on the videos. For a debate, the hardest part is getting people to actually sign up and debate and debate on the mic and be willing for that debate to go on YouTube. The actual editing process is relatively simple for those. In terms of the scripted videos, the ones that I release each Saturday, those can take uh, sometimes quite a while and sometimes relatively short amount of time. I would say that uh, you take the syntax uh, video, for instance, that script probably took about three to four hours to create. It probably took about another four to five hours to edit. And so altogether, it's about a whole day of work to make the syntax video. But if you look at a video like the Can Capitalism Reform, uh, that was a script that I was working on for several weeks. Uh, and the editing process probably took multiple days. Uh, and it also went through a lot of revisions and things like that. And so depending on the video to put an hour amount on it, for each minute of a scripted video you see from me, it probably takes between one and two hours to produce that minute. And so if you see a 10 minute video, it probably took between 10 and 20 hours of collective work uh, from the writing of the script, the research process, to the editing, to the rendering, to the uploading, to actually get that video out uh, to be uh, viewed by you guys. What advice would you give to economics undergrads? Well, my advice would be largely similar to my advice for somebody going into the economics profession on the graduate level, which would just be to take advantage of the university resources that surround you. If your university offers uh, clubs, if your university offers career services that can help you get a job, go to all of those meetings, participate as heavily as you can, make as many connections as you can. Uh, the reality is, unless you're studying medicine or unless you're studying some incredibly advanced engineering or something like that, uh, you're going to need connections in order to get a good job after college. You know, I once thought of it like this, where uh, say that somebody who graduates with an engineering degree, well, Anybody with an engineering degree can typically get a job, but to get very quality jobs, you're still going to need connections. And in the case with economics and finance, it's similar to a somewhat lesser degree, but it's still the case that anybody with an economics or a finance undergrad can probably get a job. But to actually get a relatively quality job, you're going to need to build your connections. You're going to need to build your connections most of the time, and your connections are oftentimes going to inform that first good job that you get. And then that first good job can inform the next subsequent jobs that you can. Why do you have two master's degrees? And which which do you use in your work? So I have two master's degrees because my economics master's program was accelerated. So it only actually took a year to get my first master's degree. I was 21 when I got my first master's degree. And so I figured that, hey, I didn't really want to enter the workforce at 21 with a master's degree. I'd rather just enter at the same time as my high school cohort with extra education. So that's kind of what my logic was. And so I ended up studying economics and finance. I graduated at 23 with a couple master's degrees, which was pretty cool. Is China going to liberalize as they switch to a service economy? How much will its age demographics hurt its future? I'm not really sure how much China is willing to liberalize beyond this point. It's really hard to say. I think what might cause China to liberalize is probably a credit crunch, which I think is probably coming to China somewhat soon, but that remains to be seen. In terms of how much its aging demographic will hurt its future, it really depends on how they handle it. Um, the reality is, is that an economy like China's is very susceptible to the sort of stagnation that Japan's is susceptible to. The truth is, the best way to handle an aging demographic is immigration. But the reality is that for China, immigration is sort of a government threat to their institutions, right? If you have a bunch of immigrants from Western countries or you have a bunch of immigrants from countries where they're more used to being more free, well, that might represent a systemic threat to their way of governing. But also, at the same time, their demographics are going to hurt their economy, and it could lead to their economy becoming somewhat stagnated, 
like the Japanese economy. And so although it doesn't necessarily remain to be seen, I think that some of those age demographics have already hurt the Chinese economy. Uh, it is the case that its age demographics will continue to hurt and it will probably continue to hurt more and more unless they open up their system to immigration. What are the chances of armed conflict over Taiwan? Uh, the answer to that is probably very, very low. I don't think that there's really any scenario where the Chinese are so bold that they would actually invade Taiwan or attempt to take it over. The actual Chinese policy is one China, two systems. And so they're willing to at least play the game of pretend that Taiwan is part of China. And they're willing to at least ostensibly allow Taiwan to exist somewhat autonomously. And that's probably built on the back of a relatively robust defense that the US provides to Taiwan and protection and weapons and things like that. Foreign policy wise, are you an interventionalist? I'm generally pretty hesitant to recommend or defend the idea of intervening in another country's affairs, but it depends on the issue. And oftentimes the outcomes can not only speak for themselves, but hopefully try to color whether or not you should do future interventions. I think that a lot of times all you can do is learn from past mistakes or past successes and go from there. It seems like a lot of the times interventions by governments just do not work out. Uh, but I'm sure that there's examples of successes of interventions and all you can do is look at those successes and try to determine if the current context fits those and if they don't, don't do it. If they do, do do it, maybe. Um, but even then, I think that I'm I'm relatively hesitant to recommend or defend any interventionalist type activities because it seems like the bulk of them end up going pretty badly. Keep or abandon the filibuster and electoral college. I would abandon both the filibuster and the electoral college. Do you have any favorite philosophers? Not really. I'm not super into philosophy or philosophical discussions, as I said in my conversation with Christian Watson and in my conversation with Socialism Done Left. So honestly, I, I really don't. Um, I, there's probably people who could be considered philosophers that I have favorable opinions to, but I, I don't really Really think about it a lot in terms of a, a broad field. Thoughts on the entitlement crisis discourse. Will Medicare and Social Security run out of money? Uh, the truth is Medicare and Social Security will run out of money, quote unquote, but that doesn't really mean that there's a lot of cause for concern. When they say run out of money, essentially all they're saying is that the difference between the contributions and the interest that those contributions get in the form of government treasuries means that there will be less of that money going into the system than is going out in the form of paying out benefits. But to me, this isn't really the biggest concern just because the idea of taking out a small deficit in order to pay for those systems or very, very marginally raising the taxation to fund those systems uh, doesn't really seem like it'll bankrupt the US economy. A lot of the discourse surrounding the quote unquote Medicare Social Security crisis is very overblown. It's often built on a lack of understanding of these systems, and it's often built on a lack of understanding of credit markets and the actual effects of running deficits. Was crushing unions needed to stop inflation in the 1970s slash early 1980s? Was the Volcker shock justified? I heard some people try to actually link the idea that inflation in the late 1970s and mid 1970s actually gave rise to economic conservatism, and that this actually caused a lot of the union busting that happened in the 1980s. But the truth is, I haven't really seen a lot of people draw the actual bright lines to establish this link, uh, so I'm not really sure I could comment on that. Was the Volcker shock justified? I would say absolutely. It seems like the proof is in the pudding, and the reality is that the Volcker uh, shock did raise rates to astronomical rates. Uh, for instance, I think the mortgage on my grandmother's house in the late 1970s was like 30% or something insane like that. Uh, which of course she later refinanced because of course she did but it does seem justified it seems like uh, we do have stable prices as a result of that and it does seem like it did improve the economy structurally and we haven't really had the same problems for the last 40 some years what is your favorite movie i'll do you one better this list is subject to change but i'll give you my top five because i keep track of it relatively closely my number one is probably shawshank redemption my number two is green mile my number three is forrest gump my number four is the big short and my number five guilty pleasure favorite movie is v for vendetta what economic issues have you changed your mind recently on i would say the biggest thing that i've changed my mind on recently is the idea of public housing i would say that public housing has historically been given a bad rep in america because public housing in America is pretty fucking awful. But it's not awful because public housing is inherently awful. It's awful because of the way that America went about funding and building public housing. There are great examples of public housing projects, and I think it's important to learn from them as public housing can be integral in actually giving people affordable housing and rental options. Although at the same time, it's important to encourage private development as well. What do you think of the narrative that capitalism can be replaced just like feudalism was? Well, I've heard socialists and communists say something like, well, 
feudalism, you know, people couldn't imagine the idea of capitalism at the time that feudalism was existing, and socialism is just the same, that, you know, you can't imagine a socialist world because you live in a capitalist one. And there's arguably some merit to this argument. Of course, the idea that capitalism could theoretically be replaced by socialism or another economic system of organization is possible, but overall it seems a little bit unlikely, at least in the sense that capitalism has proven to be a very, very robust system of economic organization, but hey, it's always possible that it could be replaced later on either by force or by a cultural change. How does China's economy work? Is it mostly private or state-run sectors? Don't quote me on this, but I think that a stat I saw was that of China's GDP, about 40% of it comes from state-owned enterprises. You can actually watch my central planning video about Maoist China to learn more, but essentially the way that China's economy works is that most businesses have to sell some portion of their ownership to the government, uh, and some businesses have to sell more of that ownership depending on the industry, and some industries are totally state-owned. I think that the steel industry, for instance, is totally state-owned, where the equity is owned by the government, although they are allowed to somewhat privately organize with the oversight of the government in general. Opinions on the ECP and market socialism. I assume by ECP you mean economic calculation problem, and by market socialism you mean market socialism. The economic calculation problem is interesting, and it is certainly a relatively large defeater for central planning a broad economy. I think that it is difficult for central planners to determine a broad economy's efficient allocation of resources overall. In terms of market socialism, I'm very skeptical on the system. It seems like a lot of the structures are negative for growth and investment, and it seems like a lot of the benefits of that system can actually be accomplished under a capitalist framework anyway. Do you think market socialism is practicable, or could it be? I think that it is certainly possible to implement a strict form of market socialism, although it wouldn't necessarily be positive, and it also depends on how people define market socialism. The question shouldn't really be, is it possible to implement market socialism? Because it certainly is. The question should be, what is the sustainability of market socialism and and would it be better than the system we have now? And I think the answer to the first question is that it wouldn't be very sustainable. And the answer to the second question is no, it would not be better than what we have now, at least in my opinion. What is your ideology, economics, and socially? I essentially align between the far left and the center left. I would say that I'm a relatively progressive uh, economics type minded person. And what that means is that I do support things like minimum wages, heavy unionization, worker board membership, uh, or democratic structures in the workplace in general, relatively heavy oversight of labor. Things like national industry sometimes make sense. So I think that the idea of like a post office or a military organization makes sense to be nationally run. I would say that there's probably room for discussions regarding healthcare in the same vein. Um, in terms of socially, I'm essentially as liberal socially as you can imagine. I'm pro-trans rights, pro-gay rights. I think that people should have a right to get an abortion if they want. Uh, things like that. Opinions on the political compass, do you think it's accurate? And it seems that we have another misspelling, either between myself or entrusted. See, it's is the wrong it's, it should be it apostrophe s. So you can either cancel myself or entrusted for that one. I would say that the political compass is relatively accurate. Uh, the problem is that a lot of the framing of the questions leads a lot of people to become uh, liberal left. I think that there was a funny example of like Blair White getting actually a lib left uh, categorization for their beliefs, but then she ended up uh, looking up a test that had a center right uh, result, but the reality was she was actually lib left based on her answers, which was kind of funny. What are your thoughts on full reserve banking? For those of you who don't know, full reserve banking is the idea that instead of banks being able to lend out deposit or money in, and actually create money and credit in that way, um, all the money that you put into a bank, they would have to hold and they would only give it out to you one for one. So banks would essentially be very, very limited in what they would be able to lend out uh, in that regard. I think this would be terrible for investment. It would be terrible for uh, even depositors, because investment is built on the back of businesses most of the time, obviously. Do you think our current fractional reserve system needs improvement, or is it perfectly fine the way it is? I think you could probably argue for certain reforms, but I think overall just the idea of a fractional reserve banking system is uh, perfectly reasonable. Um, although reform by reform, I'm sure we can find some agreement there. Thoughts on a LTV as opposed to a wealth tax. I think land value taxes make a lot of sense. In terms of comparisons to a wealth tax, I would say that I would probably prefer a land value tax to a wealth tax. Thoughts on a land value tax, I suppose more broadly. I think a land value taxes make a lot of sense relative to property taxes. Um, it does seem to make sense that it would encourage people to develop. And so particularly in highly urbanized areas, land value taxes make a ton of sense.
Why does the IMF implement policies like austerity in countries that need help, like in Greece during the 2009 financial crisis? Well, it's because the IMF is essentially just an international bank, and so it makes sense for them to implement structures that increase the chances that their loan would be paid back. Although the IMF did reform its thinking and essentially find that austerity doesn't seem to really work, uh, who'd have fucking thought that austerity was bad, especially during a crisis? Do you think that the IMF's policies make society and the economy worse than it was in the the first place. Uh, the literature on this is somewhat mixed, and so I have to take a somewhat neutral position. It seems like there are examples where the IMF's policies have uh, created economic growth. There are also examples where the IMF's policies have stagnated economic growth. Uh, and so over overall, it seems like the IMF's policies on an economic and societal level seem to be a mixed bag. What do you think causes the great moderation? The only thing I can really think of is the idea that we had uh, a broad adoption of relatively independent monetary institutions that could very robustly control the level of prices, which decreased the volatility in the economy overall, because businesses and actors in the business realm alike had an ability to trust and expect that prices would be maintained and stable. Why did you choose the name Econoboy? Well, it's kind of a weird story. I became familiar with an author whose last name was Economan, and I thought that was a really cool-ass last name. So, of course, being interested in economics, I thought of this last name and then added boy on the end because boy is a funny word, and so thus Econoboy was born. Have there been policies excluding immigration to solve the problem of not having enough young people, falling birth rates, and or an aging population? The answer to this question is not any that I am familiar with. It seems like immigration is is the best way to solve these issues. How should SOCDEM parties and governments deal with migrant crises, especially with fears of radicalized immigrants, which I am not saying are valid? The answer is probably to implement immigration structures that would help immigrants assimilate into society in the form of learning the language and general cultural practices of a nation where culture clash might be possible. The truth is migrant crises are relatively rare, but when they happen, if you have systems like this in place, it can help uh, ensure that people have the ability to enter your country, contribute to your economy, but also be functional members within that society, uh, at the very least in the form of knowing the language and being able to transact and engage in everyday discourse. How can our neoliberal group help make change in the real world? Well, I would say that if you believe in left-to-center or social democratic type policies, the best way to make change is to start small. Volunteer for a local city council person's campaign, start joining citizen boards in your local city government, try to make as many political connections as you can, and just generally get involved in the community. Do you have a plan to become a politician? I would say that running for office has always been very interesting for me, and I would love to do it, although it's hard to plan to be in politics because the field of politics is very volatile, it's very much so based on insider connections, and it's also very much based on fundraising, and so unless you have uh, those two things, it can be difficult to break into the system, and so if you want to, that's why I'd say it's important to start small and build your way up from there. What do you think about ordo liberalism? When I looked this up, I didn't really see a functional difference between it and social democracy, so overall it seems okay, I suppose. What do you think would be the best alternative to a $15 minimum wage and why? I think the best alternative to a minimum wage is just to have a system of fairly robust union membership and collective bargaining with democratic structures in the workplace like worker board membership, at least up to one third, if not up to parity, which means 50% of the board would have workers on it. These systems allow a more company by company setting of wages and tend to raise wages overall. I think at the same time, having a state with a robust welfare system and a robust education and training program can give employees a lot more collective bargaining because if they don't want to work for the wage offered, they can simply rely on the state so that they have more bargaining leverage in general. Within the realm of minimum wages, if we weren't going to do a $15 minimum wage flatly, something like an $11 or $12 minimum wage tied to median wage growth probably makes sense, or maybe a $15 minimum wage for the most expensive uh, counties and then a a local index would tie the minimum wage to what is up to maybe 60 or 70 percent of the medium wage for those counties might be the best. What are your thoughts on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Do you support a one-state solution or a two-state solution, and do you support the BDS movement? I think that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is very complex, and so I can't really give a hard and fast opinion on it other than to say that I do support a two-state solution. I think that there's certainly room for a declinching of fists on both sides, and I do hope that eventually the Israeli and Palestinian governments are able to work side by side.
In terms of the BDS movement, unfortunately, I haven't had a lot of great experience with advocates for BDS. Some people who have supported the BDS movement have told me that the BDS movement literally means you do not do business with Israelis, which I think is certainly not a very positive policy, and it's of course very bigoted as well. But then other people have described it as simply not doing business with companies that support the uh, Israeli government, which I think is maybe a... Um, I mean, you know, arguably more reasonable, but I would say that overall it doesn't really make sense to economically boycott Israel or companies that support Israel. What makes more sense is for the U.S. to use its soft power to have Israel implement a more free and liberal style government uh, that we have in America. What do you think about the efficient market hypothesis and technical analysis in financial markets? For those of you that don't know, the efficient market hypothesis is the idea that asset prices, typically referring to things like maybe foreign exchange rates or stock values or bond prices, essentially reflects all of the available information. So um, all the uh, news coverage of a stock, say for instance, all of the uh, potential uh, dealings uh, within the company that can get out into the public, uh, you know, th things like that, that uh, essentially asset prices are properly valued by the market and that the market is properly reflecting the information that is available. Technical analysis is essentially the, uh, it's, it's, it's also often used in the field of valuing uh, equities and bonds and, and FX markets and things and maybe commodity prices as well. It's just the attempt to forecast something based on its previous values. And so, you know, if, if something, and it's a relatively reasonable idea, you know, if something was uh, $2 yesterday, well, what are the chances that it's $2 today? Well, it's actually pretty high, uh, all else equal. But of course, you know, if, if forecasting were that easy, um, we, we we would, uh, we would either all be mil millionaires or none of us would be because we would be able to tell the future. Um, but it is a, a good exercise. In terms of what do I think about the efficient market hypothesis and technical analysis, uh, number one, I think that the efficient market hypothesis is true. I think that generally uh, what we tend to find in the literature are attempts at disproving the efficient market hypothesis that, oh, asset values typically don't uh, reflect all available information and the market doesn't properly value things. Um, and the truth is that this is true maybe on a micro level or maybe uh, depending on the time scale, it can be the case. You know, for instance, bubbles do exist. Um, and 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 it's po it's possible for like uh, for instance insider trading exists and things like that can distort the market and so uh, the market's able to be distorted um, but generally at any given time with any given asset uh, it's typically the case that uh, the asset is 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 properly valued although uh, again if that were the case uh, at every single point in time across every asset class and every individual asset uh, it wouldn't be uh, possible to make money off of the stock market because any idea you might have for the movement of that stock. Uh, would very simply just be the result of all the information that everyone has. And so any information you think you can provide would be impossible because, well, it's already reflected in the asset value, which, of course, isn't always the case. Uh, in terms of technical analysis, al although simplistic, it does uh, allow you to um, oftentimes benchmark any forecast that you might want to do. So if you start looking into economic forecasting, for instance, uh, one thing that you can benchmark any forecast you develop uh, against is uh, the technical analysis forecast or maybe a random walk forecast. Things like that allow you to essentially tell whether or not your uh, forecast that you've developed is good or not because it at least beats technical analysis or uh, random walk forecasts. How can you stop the ruling class or other parties from rolling back reforms? So the answer to the first part, how to stop the quote unquote ruling class, uh, is that uh, it's really important to have a robust uh, liberal democracy where everyone participates. Uh, but it's also important to uh, ensure that there are structures in the economy, but also in the governing state that uh, ensure that everyone's educated, that everyone's at least with some uh, relativity uh, politically active and interested in the goings on around them. Uh, in terms of how you do that, there's a plethora of ways. I think that one part is to uh, focus at least a little bit on government uh, from an early age, talk about the importance of voting in uh, when you're educating students and they're growing up. I think another way is probably to implement some sort of a referendum system that allows uh, everyone above the age of 18 to vote in. And so uh, if you had uh, a policy that might be affecting you, it might be important to go out and vote on it. That could be another way to get people politically engaged. Um, and so there's not one policy that is a perfect answer to that question, but in general, have an informed voting populace that is at least relatively active and all the ways that get you there are you know, ways that you can prevent the ruling class from quote unquote rolling back reforms. What are your thoughts on a nationalized internet service provider like Australia's NBN? So I'm not actually super familiar with Australia's NBN. I don't know what it's like. Um, I can, at least from uh, a very 
a cursory uh, experience when talking to Australians or when talking to uh, people who stream video games from Australia or people who compete in tournaments from Australia. They always talk about how shitty the internet is in Australia, um, although I'm not sure. Maybe the nationalized internet service uh, makes it a lot better than it would be otherwise. Who knows? Um, but I would say that in general, I'm actually very in favor of like a USPS style system, but for internet. So if we had, for instance, a government entity that would be able to extend high speed broadband access to uh, rural communities and uh, communities that might be on the fringes of society and not necessarily able to get any sort of attention from the big name ISPs, well, the government could come in and essentially provide a natural monopoly type service to those entities at a low and probably subsidized cost. And that would be good. I think that internet is the way that most people connect to the world and the broader world. It's uh, the way that a lot of us engage in our discourse and our uh, relationships. And so it's important that everyone has access to that very vital resource in the technological age that we're in now. What do you believe the advancement of automation could spell for the future of capitalism? Well, first I see that either I or Neo Chatterbox did not capitalize the W and again, you know, cancel either myself or Neo Chatterbox for that one. I'm not sure if automation or capitalism necessarily eat each other. I think that in the presence of automation and perhaps in the presence of uh, the type of technological advancements that could make society uh, abundant of all of the wealth and material resources that we could ask for, um, and at the same time, assuming that those uh, resources can get distributed properly, uh, I'm not sure necessarily automation would be such a bad thing. Now, what it would mean is that in a capitalist framework, you would have to have some sort of tax structure that could take advantage of those gains, but also mitigate the losses. You know, not everyone's going to be a computer programmer, not everyone's going to be a robotics engineer. And so uh, for those people, how can we connect them to the resources they need either to um, move uh, elsewhere in the country to get a job that they're passionate in? How can we connect them to the educational requirements or the uh, education that they might uh, desire in order to transition their careers? Um, or how can we support them in the form of maybe a negative income tax or a UBI so that they can maintain their lifestyle that they have currently, at least to a certain extent? I guess to round out the answer to your question, automation in a world where the automation is essentially so advanced that it gives us everything we want, but also at the same time could put a lot of us out of work, would just mean that the government would need to adopt certain structures so that we could redistribute the gains from that automation in order to fund programs that would take care of those people who would lose out from such technological advancement. Could a computerized planned economy be viable in the future as technology improves? Obviously, in an imagined world where we have such a technology, I guess in theory it could be possible. You could certainly write a story where it's possible, but I'm not really sure how long it would take to get there. And I'm also not sure the actual ability for a machine or anything like that to properly capture all of the different market mechanisms that are going on uh, that you know you would need to capture if you're talking about planning essentially an entire economy. At the same time, the plain answer to your question is that it is possible, although I'm very skeptical on the timeline of such a technology. I'm very skeptical on whether or not, even if that technology existed, people would even want it to be implemented. And I'm also very skeptical on, of course, the actual ability for that technology to develop in the first place. Do you think having mandated cooperatives in certain industries could mitigate the problems laid out in your video? So this person's probably talking about the video that I made called The Economics of Worker Cooperatives, where I kind of talk about potentially some structural problems with worker cooperatives as a mandate in the economy. And I would say arguably, yes, you could mitigate some of the problems that I'm talking about with structural unemployment. You know, if, if you were to uh, mandate cooperatives in industries that are historically low fixed costs, you know, so if it's like, hey, the restaurant industry has to be uh, worker cooperatives from now on, that might make some sense. But the reality is, it doesn't really seem to me that any industry where you would mandate cooperatives uh, would be better if rather we just had a mix of private organization and cooperative organization. So a system where you incentivize cooperatives to be formed or you just allow them to be formed and also allowed private capital to form and hire employees in the first place. You can capture a lot of the gains of cooperative ownership without experiencing a lot of the structural problems with fully employed cooperative ownership. Would worker owners be responsible for the debt of the business if a cooperative failed? Is this a potential argument against cooperatives? Well, the answer to this kind of just depends on the governing structure. So the full answer could be that it could be the case that worker cooperatives would be responsible for the debt of the business if the cooperative failed. So um, for instance, if uh, if in this system we didn't have an ability for uh, workers to declare bankruptcy, 
uh, say in the system we had a state-run bank where they didn't forgive any loans, well, they would uh, be on the hook for that. Now, uh, if they didn't have the ability to uh, pay the debt based on their personal assets or based on the business assets, well, um, then I guess they would essentially be forced into servitude. Um, although what would probably be the reality is that there would be some sort of bankruptcy system like we have now where uh, the workers could essentially just collectively get together and decide, hey, we can't, we essentially just can't fulfill our obligations. And we also can't pay off this debt by selling assets or by uh, selling our personal assets or putting our personal money back into the business. And so we need to declare bankruptcy. And what essentially that would mean is that the worker owners of this company uh, would be able to refinance their debt. They would probably get some really sweet deal. Like, you know, they'd only have to pay back like half of their debt or they'd only have to pay back uh, 20 or 30% of their debt, something like that. Um, but the long-term implication of that is that they would probably have a very, very, very difficult time of establishing credit uh, in the future. Um, and the cascading effect of that could be that in a system where uh, worker ownership was ubiquitous, was mandated, um, they might have a really hard time getting uh, hired. Um, it's currently the case that some jobs actually do ask for your credit score, even in a privately run system. But I would imagine that in a system that was uh, dominated by worker ownership, you would probably have very stringent uh, credit requirements for getting hired because obviously being brought on as an owner, um, that could look bad on your business uh, if you're applying for credit and an owner that you just brought in that's bringing on, you know, uh, one divided by X amount of capital and, and interest in the business uh, has a history of declaring bankruptcy or, you know, being, per being party to uh, businesses that have failed. Um, and so to answer the second question, is this a potential argument against cooperatives? Uh, the answer is yes, it is a potential argument uh, against cooperatives. What are your thoughts on Bernie Sanders and the squad? I think Bernie Sanders and the squad are great. Um, I think that they do a lot of good work. Um, I would say that depending on the issue, we probably don't align totally. Um, but overall, I just think that the, 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 the general atmosphere surrounding that group is very powerful. I think the coolest part of them is the fact that they're a loud group of people who do not take shit from anyone because they don't take donations from anyone other than the people in the country and within their districts. I think that that takes a lot of guts, especially in Washington. And I think a lot of the discourse coming from the progressive wing of the Democratic Party has really pushed the Democratic Party to be a, a little bit more powerful, a little bit more willing to exert their influence uh, when in government. I think that's something that hamstrung the Obama administration in 2009 when they actually all took office was the fact that it didn't seem like they were willing to pass a bill without uh, bipartisan support. But at the time, the Republicans were so unwilling to work with them, it kind of just meant that they didn't get anything that they wanted and they weren't able to govern as effectively as they could have if they were willing to move without Republican support. And I am glad that Bernie Sanders and the squad have been able to push the Democratic party a little bit more into that direction and uh, i think that that's materialized uh, at least as of right now a couple you know a few months into uh, biden's term uh, into a huge stimulus package that we wouldn't have seen otherwise if uh, joe biden or the members of the democratic party had absolutely insisted on uh, bipartisan support for their proposal when and how did you become a social democrat so the answer is i'm not really sure i guess i just looked up social democracy one day when someone mentioned it and i kind of figured oh that's what i am social democrat as an ideology is similar to pretty much every other ideology which is that it is a somewhat loose and a somewhat static and malleable group of ideas and values and potentially policy proposals with a label associated with it and its grouping and so when it came to when did i become a social democrat i essentially became a social democrat as soon as i found out what social democracy was because I kind of had the values and the positions already put together uh, in terms of how, which might explain, you know, how did I get all those positions? Um, the answer is through a long and slow process of education. So I, I, I went to college and studied politics and uh, got a, a more in-depth look at governance and governing structures and uh, political institutions and how those are formed, which was really interesting, uh, and, and, and how to make them robust. And so uh, after that, I studied uh, economics as part of my, my double major, I suppose, in undergrad and then throughout grad school. Uh, and I kind of went in with, uh, you know, certain views, but then certain views, either I became, you know, more refined on, you could say. I mean, I you know, for instance, I was probably a lot more aligned with Bernie Sanders before I studied economics. And then after I studied economics and got a, a much more in-depth view on economics and finance, I... Uh, probably aligned more with Elizabeth Warren, you know, slightly farther uh, to the right, you could say. Uh, looking up all the different models that were available uh, in the world, I just kind of seemed to align with the more social democratic models uh, of the Nordic countries and in Europe. What got you into politics? Um, the answer probably most fundamentally is Barack Obama. I would say that when he ran for president in 2008, he did inspire uh, many millions of young people to get engaged with politics uh, for the first time. And I was one of those 
uh, young people. So I would have been like 12 or 13 when that was happening. Um, and then throughout that time and throughout my life, I've just always been fascinated by politics. You know, the 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 people who have power over you, the politicians, uh, are uh, it's a fascinating group of people to study. Um, and it's important that people be engaged with that group of people because, hey, we live in a democracy for a reason. You know, we value the idea of citizen engagement. Uh, and it's because we think that it makes governments more successful and work better when uh, they reflect at least reasonably so the views of the people that elected them. And so uh, I've always been interested in uh, politics, I guess, because those uh, politicians can uh, tell you what taxes to pay and what laws to follow. So I guess uh, to me, it made sense that everyone would be uh, pretty deeply interested in politics, though that's obviously not practically the case. Uh, it certainly meant that I at least was very deeply interested. What policies do you think developing nations should pursue? Should they go for social democratic policies or focus on austerity? So I think I'll answer the second part of the question first, uh, which is they should not focus on austerity. I think that a lot of developing countries, when they're developing, they really struggle with the relationship between three main actors and the government. Uh, and if you can get the relationship between these three main actors under control, uh, they can uh, then go forward with a lot of really good reforms and policies from there, um, either because they're going to get a lot more foreign direct investment, uh, they're going to get a lot more access to international credit, uh, or they're going to be able to issue debt in such a way that they can actually fund uh, good uh, you know, government services that would be able to uplift a lot of their people out of poverty and get them uh, educated and, and things like that. And so those three main institutions have to do with the uh, monetary state, so how the monetary state is governed. Um, that that should be a process that is as politically independent as possible, and that should be a process that uh, is focused on maximizing employment while also stabilizing prices. Um, and the military is another one. So the military needs to be uh, a wing of the civilian government. Um, so we've seen, especially in uh, Latin America and Southeast Asia and in, uh, in Africa as well, um, that a lot of these nations are susceptible for one reason or a multitude of reasons or others uh, to uh, military rule and the propensity of those militaries to uh, exert undue influence on the government, uh, whereas the government should really be run by civilians in a democratic structure and then give the orders to the military. And many nations struggle to uh, find that balance uh, in general. The third institution is really just the judiciary or the adjudication system of that nation. So it's very important that the court system be relatively independent of the political uh, gamesmanship and processes that go on. If you can have an independent court system, you can root out corruption, uh, or at least you have the tools to root out corruption uh, and go from there. And uh, any government that has a significant amount of corruption um, is going to struggle generally with uh, the things that I mentioned, getting foreign investment, uh, getting access to credit, uh, issuing uh, debt to fund these government services uh, and, and, and things like that. Can social democracy be effective in a third world country? Are there any examples or close cases of similar models in Asia? So I think that social democracy or social democratic type policies can be effective in the third world. I mean, the idea of offering uh, decent government services in the fields of healthcare and education uh, are, are certainly very reasonable. Uh, and I think that they are uh, perhaps even more so advantageous in the third world or in underdeveloped nations. As far as your second question, are there any examples or close cases of similar models in Asia? Uh, it kind of just depends on who you ask. So for for instance, some people might label South Korea and Taiwan as social democratic countries because they have robust health services, for instance. Or, or some people might label Singapore as a social democracy because uh, the state essentially subsidizes almost everything in Singapore, right? Um, but also, uh, a lot of these countries are very socially conservative, and that can be reflected in the policies as well. And so, you know, do you distinguish between like the social and the economic axes of social democracy and and what does that really look like? It kind of just depends model by model whether you could call it social democracy. Uh, but at the same time, like I said, an ideology is just a loose configuration of uh, values and policies. And so uh, the, the term social democracy uh, can be about as vacuous as any other term in terms of uh, locking down what an ideology really is. Do you have any long-term goals with the channel? Uh, the answer is not really. Um, I, I guess that sounds kind of weird to say, but um, I, you know, I, I don't really have any uh, long-term goals in the sense like, oh, I want to uh, debate destiny or I want to get 100,000 subscribers or I want to make, you know, $500 a month for my YouTube channel or, or I want to stream to 100 concurrence or things like that. I, I don't really have any goals like that. I more or less just have uh, the videos that I do on a, on a, on a, on a semi-regular basis, you know, at least once a week. And I'm just kind of going from there and having fun with it. You know, like I said, this is, this is fun. This is a hobby. 
um, uh, at least for now. And I don't really expect that to change anytime soon. Uh, the prospect of having like a Patreon or something like that is something that I might do in the future, um, but you never know. Uh, so I just kind of take it one day at a time, just kind of having fun interacting with all you guys in the meantime. Thoughts on the neoliberal shift away from the post-war consensus? I guess my general thoughts are that there's probably some value to trying to limit government bureaucracy and government processes as much as you can. Obviously, uh, nobody likes dealing with a bureaucrat or, or, or bureaucratic processes, but uh, the second side of that coin is that a lot of these government services are very vital and a lot of these institutions are very vital like unions. Uh, and so uh, I think, you know, you could say the neoliberal shift away from the post-war consensus where we focus on unionization, we focus on strong institutions uh, in the communities, we focus on uh, maximum employment that is uh, driven on part uh, through the back of deficit spending and government services when needed. Um, I think that that's unfortunate. Uh, and I think that that's why you've seen, especially uh, you know, r really post uh, Trump getting elected and, and everything that cascaded from that, especially up to this day uh, and leading right up to the coronavirus recession, a move really starkly away from that. Um, you can look at 2020 as perhaps a focal point where governments were all forced into recession essentially because of the COVID lockdown. Uh, and uh, they essentially all decided, look, we're, you know, at least for the developed economies, all the ones that I'm familiar with, we're not going to do austerity again. It was a disaster in 2008 when we did it. Um, and so we're going to spend our way out of this. And we're going to really put our Keynesian hats on uh, and ensure that we can get out of this uh, as smoothly as possible. I think that that was really positive. Uh, and so hopefully the results uh, speak for themselves in the next year or two as we see the economies come out of recession. Uh, and uh, it turns out to be very positive and hopefully a sort of uh, ideology shift away from uh, that sort of neoliberal phase uh, that's cascaded for probably the last 40 years. How do you feel about ruining the youth by platforming communist socialist countries like the Nordic ones? Well, honestly, it feels great. Long live the USSR and Marx's memory. Well, as far as I know, that was the last question that was submitted to me. Like I said, if I should expand on anything or you have any further follow-up questions uh, or original questions, I guess leave them in the comments to this video. Seriously, thanks for watching. These first 500 subscribers and now around 575 or 600 subscribers is super exciting to see, especially for a guy who's really just making uh, economic videos that could certainly be considered boring by most. So I appreciate that you appreciate these videos. Um, other than that, uh, if you like these videos, be sure to leave a like, comment, tell me you like them, uh, tell your friends, and if you hate these videos, go ahead and leave a dislike. Tell me that you hate me in the comments. Be sure to tell me that I am nitpicking and biased. Call me a communist and also be sure to report the video. Thanks for watching.